All right, this morning we are continuing our study uh, on creation versus evolution. Uh, a couple weeks ago we read the Genesis 1 account. What did God say? How did God say that God did it? That kind of ends the discussion for me, and I know it does for you as well. We looked um, last time at uh, some just amazing statements to me that were made by various scientists um, about the doubt that they have a known theory. And sometimes we're brainwashed into thinking, well, all these scientists accept this, and maybe they're trying to paint us as being not so bright to believe in 6,000 years and stuff like that. And I've always believed in 6,000 years. I can't remember a time when I didn't. And growing up, you know, people might question me about that, and I'll say, well, I believe it just because. And there's nothing wrong with believing just because. There's nothing believe wrong with that. But it's, the more you get into it, the more reasons there are for us to believe like we do. And it's, it's interesting to me that these scientists uh, don't have a lot of confidence on, on theory. And sometimes Bible believers in trying to combine the Bible with science will compromise things in the scriptures pertaining to dates and stuff like this. And there's not any reason to. There's not any reason to. And again, we, we kind of closed with this a uh, little bit the other day. Uh, a quote from John Eddy, an evolutionary scientist. He says, well, I believe in 4.5 billion years for the earth. So he admits that belief. But this is an interesting quote. He says, I suspect that we could live with Bishop's, Bishop Usher's value for the age of the earth and the sun. I don't think we have much in the way of observational evidence in astronomy to conflict with that. And that's a, 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 an amazing admission to me. He says, well, I believe it's 4.5 billion. But what he's saying is the 6,000 date we really don't have anything in science to contradict it. And so I found that to be interesting. A bit there, there's a little bit of difference there, absolutely. We say there's nothing in science that would contradict the 6,000 years. And, and so there's, there's reasons for us to believe like we did, or like we do. We were looking at some uh, quotes. You say, well, if that's the case, if the scientists see so many holes in their own theory, if they have doubts in their own theory, then why... Uh, do they try to propagate that to our kids and our society, to the world? Well, it was basically because they want to do what they want to do. And, and, and again, I admire them for being honest here. Here's one guy that's honest, uh, Altruist Huxley, basically says, because we want to do what we want to do. I want to be able to act any way we want to sexually, don't want any restraints from God and this sort of thing. Uh, the Humanist Manifesto uh, 2 I think was published, the first one was in 1933. I won't say this is 1973, but don't quote me on that. But uh, basically, it's kind of the same thing. You know, why do we believe this? Well, the many varieties of sexual exploration should not in themselves be considered evil. They want to live like they want to live and do what they want to do. That's the motivation. There is, and again, here's the, the term uh, sexual freedom. Uh, there is no scientific evidence, evidence to believe what they want to believe. The, the fact is they want to try to get God out of the picture. I mean, that's the whole purpose of evolution is to get God out so they can live like they want to live. Um, read that uh, there. Arthur Keith of Great Britain said evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because it's the only alternative. The only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. We just dare not accept that. We refuse to accept that again because we want to do what we want to do. All right, now uh, this, the bell called us as we were looking at this uh, uh, last Sunday. A guy named Charles Lyell wrote a book called Principles of Geology in 1830. Uh, this predated uh, Darwin's book by almost 30 years, 29 years. And uh, basically kind of a, an idea of the uh, kind of the geology, at the beginning of evolutionary geology uh, as they teach it now as far as the rock layers and stuff like that. So he was the one that kind of began that idea. And again, Charles Darwin read that, and that was influential in how he thought. But it was interesting, in a letter that he wrote to a friend, it, his motives, what was his motives? To free the science from Moses. That's what he's trying to do. So he was trying to separate. He was purposely, that was a purposely idea of his to separate uh, what the Bible says from what he was saying to try to put down in people's minds and I won't read this whole thing again, but he talked about, it was interesting, his strategy was to try to uh, befriend, uh, befriend the theologians, uh, try to flatter them, this sort of thing, to get them to go along with that. And again, basically, that's what has happened along that line. 
We mentioned this. I'm not going to go into this uh, a lot. We mentioned this a little bit in our introduction. But the, uh, the racism that comes with Darwinism, and, and it's interesting how the left will try to protect their heroes. They do that, again, in a, a very select way. Uh, those on the right, they'll try to, to trash and this sort of thing, make them look bad. Those on the left, uh, they'll try to protect. And Darwin is one of those. Now, I typed this in a few weeks ago. Uh, I can't remember what I typed in, uh, Darwin and racism or something like that. And the first thing that came up, the first thing that came about Darwin was something real positive about his outlook on the races, that uh, supposedly Darwin, Darwin was anti-slavery and this sort of thing. Some of Darwin's views, I don't know if he was anti-slavery or not, there's no doubt he had a um, very pessimistic view of other uh, skin tones and this sort of thing. So I put here, consider the title of Charles Darwin's book entitled Origin of the Species. And most of the time, that's all of the title that is printed. They'll just say the origin of the species. They never will publish the entire title because they're embarrassed of the entire title. Here's the entire title of his 1859 book. Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, and that's the mechanism that he gave for, for the, the evolution. Or here's the subtitle, The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, if you're asking yourself, is Darwin saying here by races, is he saying what we sometimes mean by races in our society? Yes, he is. He is. And so he talks about in his book this um, idea of some people being more highly evolved than others. Matter of fact, he wrote a, and I have not read this whole thing. I I've want to make myself do that at some point in time. I downloaded my computer just a year or so ago, and his sequel I've downloaded. I have not read it myself. I need to, I need to do that. I need to make myself do that. But he wrote a sequel in, I believe it was 1873, called Descent of Man, 14 years later. And in that book, in the Son of Man, he predicted the, um, the extinction of the brown and black races of the earth in his book, that the white populations of the earth are going to eventually, uh, I can't remember how he put it, enslave or uh, capture, destroy, kill the darker race of the earth. That's in his book. And people want to, to hold Darwin up as a, a champion of, of whatever. And that's, I think I mentioned that to y'all in passing. In 2020, the summer of 2020, where they were tearing down all these racist statues and all this, you need to start with this guy, in my view. Because people like Adolf Hitler, people say, well, how, did, how could Adolf Hitler have done what he did? How could he have killed six million Jews? How could he have, have plunged the world into World War II that killed 60 million people worldwide? How could Joseph Stalin had killed 30 million of his own people? How could uh, uh, Mao Zedong of China killed uh, 60 million more of his own people? How could that happen? That's what they're reading. They're reading books like this. So they were influenced by this teaching. And that's what that teaching does. It does not bring people together. It does not enlighten people. It puts people at odds with one another. And that... Um, again, it's just, just very, very unfortunate. I put here, if you, and we talk about this guy in Woods had a quote like this. If you tell a man that he descended from the slime of the mud and from the, light, uh, the line of the apes, that's the way he will live his life. On the other hand, if you tell him he is created in the image of God, then that is the standard to which he will measure himself. And that's what we need to teach our kids, not that we evolve from apes and that some of us are more highly evolved than others. We're all made in the image of God. God loves us all. So Darwin's, uh, as I just said, Darwin's writings influenced many acts of genocide in the name of science or human progress. Um, I was reading a, about, a, I guess, a study that was done on the Aborigines in the early 1900s in Australia. And basically, Aborigines were killed to study their brains and study their bodies. From what I understand, they were herded off mountains or forced to jump off cliffs. And after they died, then they would study them in the name of science. Again, why? Because of this idea. Well, well we did the same thing with American Indians. Uh, we taught the children with them to speak their own language. Yes. We teach them English yes. And other farmers and all that. We, it, it didn't work out at all. Yes. Sure yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great point. Great point. So, again, don't compromise 
on God's truth. I believe, you believe, God created the world 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour days. There's no reason not to believe that. And we're going to get into more evidence in the coming uh, weeks along this, this idea. Now, sometimes people have this idea that science can't be wrong. Well, history shows that science can be wrong. So just because science says, well, evolution is the way that it happened, doesn't make it so. How are we doing, Charlie? Don't worry, you're in there. All right. All right. Okay. All right, so science can be uh, wrong. So things, for instance, like rocks falling at different speeds. That's what science used to teach. Some rocks fall faster than others. Um, I did put this video in here, probably should have. Y'all been interested in this. But um, I think it was Galileo that uh, discovered that uh, in a vacuum, things fall at the same rate, even a feather in a bowling ball, which is still hard for me to believe. But I've, I've got the video where in a vacuum, they fall at the same rate. Amazing. But rocks don't fall at different rates, especially not in a vacuum. Bloodletting, <clears throat> the idea that, okay, to... to uh, bleed somebody purposely will bleed out the infection. And you, you've read that and studied that. The uh, barbers of that day, I think that's what they were. They were the blood letters in town. And uh, George Washington, y'all probably heard this story, but George Washington on December 12th, 1799, was a healthy 67-year-old man uh, who got sick, uh, was out in the bad weather and all this, didn't get on dry clothes, got sick. Uh, wasn't feeling well, so they brought in a doctor who bled out a pint of his blood, wasn't getting better. Eventually, they drained five pints of his blood, and he died on December 14th. Basically, his body went into shock. But that's what the science of that day taught. Take out some blood, and you're going to feel better. Well, it killed uh, the uh, uh, father of our country. Uh, planets going around the earth. Uh, things like that. Science can be wrong. Scientists can be wrong. And I know y'all know that, but I think that's important to understand. They can be wrong. We don't need to accept anything that they say, particularly on this subject, blindly. So evolution is wrong and is a lie that has been imposed on society. Now, before we get into more proofs uh, of some of these things, I want to kind of pause and look at the flood with y'all for just a minute. The flood is a fascinating subject to me on many, many levels. It's just very, very intriguing. Uh, you say, well, why is the flood important pertaining to the age of the earth and some of these evidences? Well, I want to share some of that with you. So before we delve into evidence for biblical creation further, I want to consider the worldwide flood of Noah's day. The Bible shows clearly, as we said, that the world is approximately 6,000 years of age. Evolution claims that the universe had its origins in the Big Bang roughly 14 billion years ago. Most secular scientists believe that to be the case, and they ridicule the teachings of the Bible and beliefs of Christians in respect to chronology. And I was something else I was watching this morning, a, a short video on this. They were saying that basically that's what their uh, strategy has become. Uh, not really proving anything. We say trying to that, that what you're saying is contradicting, but just to try to make fun of us, kind of like we talk about in the Scopes trial. So that's what they uh, fall into is to try to ridicule us and belittle us for what we believe and don't really have any proof to back it up, Charlie. Uh, well, what I read in the Bible, I can't give away with that. The Lord uh, let Noah know that it was going to rain 40 days and 40 nights, and after that, there'd be a rainbow. And he said it wouldn't rain uh, 40 days, 40 nights no more. That's right, Charlie. We're going to look at some of that in Genesis 6. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. At the same time, these scientific experts denied the idea of a worldwide cataclysmic flood as described in the sacred biblical text. And I get amazed at what I put in uh, parentheses, and I think I mentioned this to y'all before. In the same breath, they'll say it's impossible that the earth could have been flooded by water. A planet that's 70% of water right now, 
a planet which if you lowered the mountains and raised the valleys and trenches would be a mile and a half uh, covered with water today. So to say, again, that's an amazing statement. And then turn around the next breath and say that Mars, which doesn't have a drop of water right now, had a worldwide flood. You know, you make sense out of that to me. That makes no sense to me. So why is this important that they ignore or refuse to look at the evidence for the flood? Well, this gross oversight on the part of mainstream science has led to wildly erroneous dates regarding the beginning of everything. I firmly believe that. So why do they get some of these dates of millions and millions of years? Because they ignore the flood and what that would do to the aging process and the things that they look at and study. If the time scaffolding that props up evolution is removed, the entire theory collapses as the fake and fraud that it is, and that's why I think it is so important that we not compromise this issue. And again, some people will try to do that, say, well, maybe the earth is millions of years. No, it's not. And I think it's important not to, to uh, uh, again, concede that or, or to give in on that point. So again, what's the deal with water? Well, water multiplies the aging process, and I imagine a lot of y'all are a lot more familiar with this than I am and, and have things you can add to this and the breakdown of chemicals. If the entire planet was underwater for months, as the Bible says that it was, the earth would appear to be much older than it really is. There's no doubt about that. I mean, even scientists don't believe in the flood if you say, well, what, what would it be like if the world had been covered by water? It'd look a lot older than it is right now. So we'll look at some of the evidence for a worldwide deluge and pre-flood conditions on earth. All right, so in Genesis 2, so we read Genesis 1 with y'all uh, a couple weeks ago. Here's the next chapter, Genesis. I'm not read the whole chapter, just a couple of quotes here. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now that sounds like, it says a mist from the earth, it sounds like that was a worldwide condition. That there was a mist that went up, like an underground irrigation system almost worldwide that watered the world. Now did that remain in place until the time of the flood? Well, it's hard to prove. I've heard preachers, I know that y'all have too, and they'll turn to Hebrews 11 that said, well, Moses warned of things that had not been seen before, what had not rained before. So I've heard that y'all have too. It, did, it had never rained before the time of the flood. Well, again, if that is the case, then uh, that tells us a lot too. Um, again, did that change somewhere in time? Well, I, again, I don't know, but the, it seems to be saying that was the way the earth was watered at this time. Uh, skipping down to Genesis 4, 19, 20 through, to, through 24, talk about the conditions spiritually of the planet. Uh, this in the line of Cain, uh, Lamech was the seventh from Adam. I still remember a sermon I heard uh, Earl Godwin preach when I was uh, probably a teenager on the seventh from Adam. And it was a pretty interesting lesson. He was talking about Lamech of the line of Cain. He was the seventh from Adam. And then on Seth's side, Enoch was the seventh from Adam and comparing and contrasting those sevens, how different they were spiritually, morally, really, really good lesson. But Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, in the name of the other, Zillah. So there seems to be the beginning of polygamy. There's no record of that before that time. So here's one of the things where people began straying from God's pattern. The pattern that Jesus identified, one man for one woman, is going back to Adam and Eve. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And uh, I've done a little reading on this, and y'all y'all probably have done more on it than I have. Uh, some of the Hebrew scholars, when they look at this, they take it almost as if Lamech is bragging that he has killed a man. And well, if God said He's going to punish anybody that hurt Cain seven times, if anybody messes with me, He's going to be He's it's going to come back on him seventy-seven times, either me or my family or whatever. So, uh, again, if that's the case, then we certainly can see maybe this being the beginning of violence on the earth. As we read in Genesis 6, that says the, the earth was violent and corrupt before God. Perhaps it's the beginning of that. On the flip side, on the other line, uh, to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. 
And so in this line, you have this line that is going the wrong direction, further and further away from God. You have Seth's line, which is getting closer and closer uh, to God. Now, one thing I wanted to uh, talk about, this idea of the mist coming up from the uh, ground. Now, one thing, and again, this is speculation uh, completely, and again, I don't know. Again, I was, again, the video I was watching this morning seemed to believe in a water canopy or ice canopy of some way. Um, I can't remember if I said this y'all the other day. Uh, more, more and more stuff I'm seeing, there are a lot of creationist scientists getting away from this idea. But again, I'll caution you on that. Just because people are getting away from it doesn't mean it wasn't true. Uh, so, again, whether it is or isn't, I don't know. We talk about the firmament there in uh, Genesis 1. God separating the water below the firmament from that above the firmament. That could just be the cloud cover. That could be, some believe this is the water canopy. But anyway, was there a water canopy above the earth? Now, was it held above the earth with a magnetic field? I don't know. Uh, in Genesis 1 and verse 7, as we said, God made the firmament. Again, later on that chapter, we read of the birds flying in the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. So again, is that cloud cover? Is that a, a full-fledged water canopy? Again, I don't know. Um, most of the waters now visible uh, was below the earth at one time. Were these chambers one of the sources for the flood waters? Well, we're going to look at that more in Genesis 6, but it talks about the fountains of the great deep being broken up. And so I can, I can visualize. I'm going to show you all some, uh, a couple of pictures later on. I can picture water gushing out from the earth. So you got the rain falling. Apparently you got water coming up from the earth in torrents too uh, during the time of the flood. Uh, Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Uh, Paul quoted that in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. For he hath founded it, he, God, hath founded it, the earth, upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So he found the earth upon the waters. And even today there's waters underground uh, in our present day. Psalm 33 and verse 7 says, He gathereth the waters of the seas together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Uh, Psalm 136, 6, To him that stretched out the earth above the waters. Uh, some scientists today uh, still believe uh, that there are, are huge water chambers under the earth. Some believe that there still may be more water below the earth than above the earth. I don't know if that's the case or not. I was um, something I saw a while back was talking about uh, Japanese scientists uh, have done studies in some of their uh, mountains and all on their island that have indicated that there's uh, salt water beneath uh, some of those mountains. So I think there's still a lot of huge water deposits even today. Uh, on our planet. Uh, fault lines are still visible. Was a ring of fire caused during the days of the flood? We'll talk more about that later on. But people laugh at the idea and say uh, the, the, the water poured out of the earth, that can't happen. Well, it, it is today. We'll go see, <laughs> we go see those things. So today we, we see that phenomenon even in the uh, form of uh, geysers. Was this a more prominent feature at one point than it is today? So certainly it is possible, people that laugh off that idea and say that water can't gush up from the ground, it still is today in some places. Well, that, scientists, scientists have shown, I've seen films where they showed under, under the ocean fountains were coming up, I guess to be fresh water. Okay, sure. interesting. That's, that's, uh, that. When, um, I don't know if Dad remembers this, I don't know if he was standing with me when I, I, I was talking to one of the Warners when they redid the field in 2002. Uh, and he was, you know, they were doing a lot of work and really tilling up the ground. And I was asking about that and why they were tilling up so much. And according to him, he said that, he said even today that like the roots of grass, if you dig deep enough as the uh, tides change and so forth, that the water comes up from underground and can water the roots uh, of the grass. Say, grass can go, roots can go down six foot into the How about that? How about that? So that's it. Even today, that phenomenon of, of the water uh, impact that still exists. Unless we stay, I think unless we stay in Job, uh, Job talked about how God said the oceans and water can come this far yep. and no further. No further. I mean, that's just amazing. Yes, it, it is. I think it's like Jeremiah 522, I think it says, like the same thing that yeah. you spoke and said, you come this far. And like you said in the Psalms, the Psalms didn't say that kind of thing. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yes, it is. Yes, it, it is. It's like the water under the earth. There's I think there's a there's somewhere a while back that the deepest the deepest part of the ocean is seven miles deep. Just, just yes. Deep as yes, thirty miles 
Something like 35, 36,000 feet. Yes. Something like that in the deepest part of the ocean. Yes, sir. That kind of bears that way. Yeah. Yeah, the Mariana Trench, I think it, I think it yeah, is. Yeah, nature is an aquifer, and whatever you call it, we're all through the Midwest, and the irrigating and all the fields are full of water that's being pulled up on top of the area. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are artesian yeah. wells everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's one down here in Fort Morgan. It only flows all the time, just a small bit. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All of all of all kind of drinking water comes from the wells. They're just deep. I think some right. of them are about 100 foot deep to get down to actually get clean water. They don't have to treat that much. But Riviera's got wells, and then all the local water sources have wells. Mobile County doesn't have wells, but they have Big Creek Lake, which they dug just to hold water. With okay. The water. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Thank y'all. All right. So looking at Noah's family and the time leading up to the flood, Genesis 5 21 through 24, and Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam. Again, that's a neat lesson. I won't go into all that right now, but pretty neat lesson. And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. And in that same lesson, I remember Brother God was making that point. He said the Bible didn't say anything about his life before his uh, son came in the world. He may have walked before God then. said he made a point that his son saw him walking with God. And I thought that was a, a great point that he made there. But after he begat Methuselah, walked with God 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And we read about that in, in Hebrews 11, mentions Enoch and, and being translated. And Methuselah, the son of Enoch, lived 187 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And of course, the oldest recorded age that we have in the Bible. Did anybody live older than Methuselah? Don't know. Could have. He's the oldest recorded uh, lifespan uh, in the scriptures. Didn't you do a sermon one time about Methuselah and not possibly have been alive at the flood? He, uh, I thought you did a sermon. He uh, died the year of the flood. Yeah. So when you, you crunch the numbers, he died the year of the flood. And so I've, I've heard people debate that. And uh, it can be hard to be dogmatic either way. But uh, so some will say, well, did Methuselah, what, did the oldest man, did he die as a result to the flood or did he die before the flood? And, and I don't know. I've, I've thought about that uh, uh, both ways. You know, I, when, when I look at it, you know, how did Noah uh, get to be such a righteous man? You know, the Bible talks about him being righteous in his generation. Uh, he had Enoch, of course, being uh, his great grandfather, who was one of the best people I guess has ever lived. It's hard for me to believe that Methuselah, could have watched his daddy for 300 years and not been a pretty decent person. That's just my opinion, and y'all can disagree with that. But uh, anyway, if Methuselah was a righteous man, and then his son Lamech was a righteous man, and they taught Noah, you know, there's, uh, I read another commentary that said that, uh, said when they, that God uh, put him into the ark and shut the door, and they waited seven days. And I heard one commentator just speculate, well, could that have been seven days of mourning for Methuselah who just passed away? I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, again, depends on what type of character. If he wasn't righteous, I think he probably perished well, in the flood. You would figure if he wasn't righteous in that day, most of the non-righteous people turned violent. And every, you wouldn't figure if you were a non-righteous person, you could survive all the violence for 900 years. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Eventually, mess up and someone would kill you. Yeah, that is true. Can you imagine having your first child at 187 years old? <laughs> no. Well, how about Noah at 500 years <laughs> when his sons were born? Yes, Charlie. Well, in uh, Isaiah 44 3, it says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring. That's the type of floods we want, isn't it, Charlie? Not this type of flood we're about to look at here, do we? All right, so Lamech lived 182 years and beget a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. So again, Lamech is talking about the Lord here, even in naming his son, So, which leads me to believe that he himself was a righteous man, and taught his son to be righteous. I could be mistaken on that. 
And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. We're going to make a point about that in a little bit uh, too. To Brother Bill's point, we talk about 187 when Methuselah had a son. And Noah was 500 years old and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Noah, by, by far, and we're going to make a point about that too, about the ages, he was much, much older than the others we read about in this account. Uh, so again, it makes you wonder, I've wondered this too, was Noah a single man until God says, I'm going to destroy the earth, and maybe as part of that, he went and found a wife and started having children. I don't know. Uh, that's speculation, I guess, on my part too. Going back to the age of the earth, somebody says, well, how do we get 6,000 years? How, how do we get that number? You can't find a verse in the Bible that says the earth is 6,000 years old. So where does that come from? So we start from Adam, year one of creation. Uh, Adam was 130 when Seth was born. And then Seth was 105 when his son was born. So Enos is born 235 years after creation. And we can follow that line as you look at these ages and years the only purpose, somebody says, well, why do we have those ages? The only purpose of that is to help us to date the planet. We can date the planet because of God giving us this information, allows us to do that. And so we can see those dates as you go down. So we can follow, again, father to son, to son, to son, to son, and so forth. So you get to Noah. Uh, he was born 1,056 years after creation. A couple of things that... Um, is pretty neat to me too. I digress here for just a minute. When you study these ages, like Methuselah was born 687 years after creation. That means, I know y'all know this, so I'll just ask this. How old does the Bible say that Adam was when he died? Close. 930. He was 930. So if he was 930, that means that Lamech, the daddy of Noah, was living and could have talked to the first man, so which is, which is kind of neat. So that means if you do the math here, y'all help me with math, he would have been 56 years old when Adam died. So for his teenage years and, and young adulthood, if, again, how big was the earth, people spread out. But if he lived in the same uh, place as Adam, here you have Adam's, this would be the ninth one, the great, 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 great grandson that could have talked with Adam at that time. Which is, which is kind of uh, neat to me. So Noah and his generation, they wouldn't have actually seen the first man. They would have heard stories about it. And is that part of the reason, too, why the world got more wicked? Because Adam died, and he couldn't tell him any more about the original creation. I don't know. But that, that's neat to me. So he is, uh, again, Noah's about 500 years old when uh, Shem was born. Does that put you at 1,556 years after creation? And we're told that Shem had a son, Arphaxad, who was born two years after the flood when Shem was 100 years old. And so that's 1,656. Uh, so actually, when you get to Shem, it says Shem, Ham, and Japheth were born when, when Noah was 500. That actually would make uh, Noah 502 when Shem himself was born, but approximately 500 when he was born. So anyway, that, mean, that can give us a, a, a firm date of 1,656 years after creation, when the flood came. So we can date that by looking at these ages there in Genesis 5. So we can continue in Genesis 10 and 11. It gives us the line from, uh, from Shem down to Abraham and those, and the same thing. It tells us when the, each was born, when the next son came along. So Selah, the son of Arphax, it was born when Arphax was 35. So again, adding the 35 to that number, we get 1,691 years after creation, his son Eber, his son Peleg, uh, which, by the way, the Bible says in uh, Genesis 10, I think it is, in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. So that's an interesting thing to study, too, uh, what he's talking about there. We may get that later on. Peleg, uh, Reu, uh, Sereg, uh, Nahor, uh, Terah, uh, Abram. This is a little bit, uh, too, there's some controversy on this, too. Uh, because it talks about that uh, Terah was 70 and it names his three sons. But then others will say, well, the Bible says that uh, Terah was 205 when he died in the, uh, the city of Haran and that Abram was 75 when he left Haran. So that would make Terah 130. 
So most commentators believe that uh, Terah began having children age 70 and that Abraham himself was 130. Uh, or, you know, Terah was 130 when Abraham was born. But there's, there's some debate about that. So again, these dates can be off by a few decades, but you can't get millions of years difference. Uh, Isaac was born when Abraham was 100, as y'all know. Uh, Jacob was bo born when Isaac was 60. Uh, now going back to Abram, just a minute. Uh, Abram uh, left Haran at the age of 75. So we can date that from creation, if Terah was 130 when Abram was born, to 2,081 years after creation. So 400, and, and so there, from there, 430 years after the promise was made to Abram to leave his people, as Paul talked about in Galatians 3.17, that we talked with y'all about a few weeks ago, and traveled to the promised land, his descendants left Egypt after being held as slaves. And I believe that's in Exodus 12, verse 40 and 41. So this means the Israelites left Egypt 2,511 years after creation. Now, again, you can't find that in the Bible where it says they left 2,511 years after creation. My point is that you can follow it pretty closely. I mean, it's, it's pretty accurate, pretty exact in what is given to us. Here's a couple of these verses real quick. So Abram departed as the Lord has spoken unto him in Genesis 12 and verse 4. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And again, we know that Terah was 205 uh, when he died in Haran. Uh, I'm not getting all this uh, again. We talk about this in Galatians. Uh, Abram was told that uh, his ancestors would be afflicted for 400 years. Uh, in Acts 7, Stephen, uh, dad did a great job talking about that recently in the book of Acts. Uh, but Stephen says that the people being treated evil for 400 years. That's a quote from just 15, 13. Here's the Exodus 12, 40 and 41. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt. Again, that doesn't say they sojourned in Egypt for 430 years, but their years they're sojourning. And a lot of Bible scholars believe that includes Abraham sojourning and Isaac sojourning and Jacob sojourning, etc. was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Paul, again, made this clearer in Galatians 3. says that Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. In this I say that the covenant, the promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12, that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which is 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. Now the law was given on Mount Sinai a year after they crossed the Red Sea. And so Paul says that 430 years was from the promise made to Abraham to the law being given. So he traces it there, not just to their time in Egypt. Again, some will disagree. And I told you it is, it is possible mathematically for them to have been there 400 years, but it's really a stretch. I showed you those ages. They would have to, some of those fathers would have been really old and had a son right before they died to make those meet. But be that as it may. All right, if we, so if we accept that or being close to that, 2511 after they left Egypt, here's another important piece of the puzzle to tie this in. Uh, and Brother Bill talked about this uh, a few years ago in his study of the kings, a very interesting study. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. So know that Solomon began building the temple 480 years after they left Egypt. Well, can we trace that? Yes, I didn't put all this in here. But you, and Brother Bill did a great job talking about the reigns of the kings. Again, we can count the years, how, many, how long the kings reigned, each one, and you can trace that back. So this occurred approximately 3,000 years ago, which means that creation occurred about 6,000 years ago. Archbishop Usher, uh, who wrote in the 1600s, and his dates were accepted by everyone until modern times. And I bought his book a couple years ago and, and have read some of it. Very interesting. He was a tremendous scholar. But Usher dates the beginning of the construction of the temple as occurring in 1012 B.C. by computing the reigns of the kings of Israel. There is not a verse in the Bible that says creation occurred in 4000 B.C. But, uh, but the number seems to add up to that amount of time. So about 6,000 years ago. Now, I would not dare to get this, uh, this exact, but Usher, in reading his book, uh, he's, again, tremendously confident in what he said. But he said, creation occurred on Sunday, October 23rd, 4004 B.C. I don't dare to say that it happened exactly that, but that's pretty confident to give you the month and the day. 
But the point is, again, that about 6,000 years is what the, the Bible clearly teaches uh, for the age of the earth. <laughs> now, we're talking about this, and um, before class, y'all were talking about the, the billions of years and the 4.5 or 14 billion. And I heard a speaker say this, and it was really uh, interesting. Uh, he said, the age of the earth has doubled every 15 years for the last 150 years. Arbitrarily, evolutionists add time thinking this is the solution to their problems. So it's interesting, when uh, their theory doesn't quite work out, let's just add more time. Uh, this doesn't work, let's just add more time. So my guess is, like that 4.5 billion years for the earth and the sun and the 14 billion, you know, 100 years from now, it's going to be more than that. They're going to have to add some more time to make it all work. But it's interesting. When you, I, I saw um, somebody at Charlton that one time, that in George Washington's day, some of the, like Voltaire and some of those that were starting to doubt God would say, well, the earth was created 70,000 years ago, which again is a far cry from millions and millions of years. But it's interesting how much it's grown over time by, by leaps and bounds. So it's doubled every 15 years. So we just need more time. Let's just add more time uh, to it. Uh, Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 3, 3-6, through 6, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's what scientists are saying today. Uniformitarianism is what they call it. This, things haven't changed. Everything's continued at the same rates as they always have been. For this they willingly are ignorant of. And I heard a speaker say in the original Greek, this means they're dumb on purpose. Somebody that's dumb on purpose. I, I like that, uh, the way that's phrased. But this they are willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. All right, so he said there's two facts they're w uh, willingly ignorant of. First, that God created the world. And then, second, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. The planet we see today is a lot different than the planet that existed, I believe, before the time of the flood. And so people that study these things, they are willfully ignorant. They want to ignore this on purpose, that there was a creation, and that the earth was flooded by a worldwide flood. So they willfully uh, forget this. Um, and I put there, how do you explain flat surfaces on the earth with millions of dead creatures in them? And that's what you see, that's what geology shows the evidence of the flood is, is around the planet, and we're going to look more at that, too. I want to share this with you. I thought this was a neat illustration. I heard a speaker talking about this. When it comes to dating things and, and talking about determining when things occurred, um, and we can all relate to this illustration. So let me share this with you and see if y'all come up with the same thing that I do. Let's uh, suppose a ship crossed the Atlantic. That's all you know. A ship crossed the Atlantic with a large coin collection from a European museum. You don't know what year it went across or anything else. There's another ship that's going across. It sinks. Years later, someone discovers the wreckage, and they pull up a handful of coins with these dates on them. I said, grab a, uh, a handful of coins. And let's, uh, again, I'm just using, uh, I don't know if they had dates on them back then. But let's say they have dates on the coins. And you read a date of 1492 or 1674. 511, 1873, 1678, 1925, the year 732. From these dates on the coins, what is the furthest point back in time that that ship could have sunk? Prior to 511. Prior to 511? Okay. I don't think I'm wording that question very well. Right. All right, so if, you've, if you follow the logic, if you see a 1925 coin, it had to, the shipwreck had to have happened after 1925 for there to be a 1925 coin, if y'all follow the logic there. And it's the same thing with the dating things that you see that people use for dating, say, you know, you can look at this and study this. It may not give you the exact date, but it gives you a limiting factor. It can't be beyond this point. And we're going to look at a number of things like that with y'all that you say, well, this doesn't necessarily say this is when it, this happened, but it couldn't have happened any sooner than this particular thing. I did not word that very well there, Brother Bill. All right, we'll pick up with that, Lord willing, next Sunday. Thank you for your great comments and great attention.